How is it when lives are taken because of some doubts? When you are not so well versed in some things and you immediately react based on some past things that you have gone through? Fortunately, this did not go unpunished at that time and the hand of justice reached the culprits. Do you know what happened on November 29, 1847? Well, members of the Cayuse Indian Nation's Y.E. Latpu tribe assassinated Protestant missionaries Marcus and Narcissa Whitman and 12 others. That's not all. Dozens of other pioneers were placed behind bars as well. The Whitman massacre occurred at a Protestant mission in a remote part of Oregon's frontier in what is now Walla Walla, Washington. Politicians in Washington, D.C. have been debating whether or not to declare the Oregon frontier a U.S. territory for years. This would last one period. The tragedy, as well as the necessity to safeguard American residents against native uprisings, pushed Congress to end discussion and they decided to act. The deaths of frontier missionaries Marcus and Narcissa Whitman near the junction of the Columbia and Walla Walla rivers in 1847 has brought several changes with it. It placed the Oregon Territory under American authority and put in motion a series of events that pushed the Columbian Plateau Indians into reservations. The Whitmans were trailblazers and Wai'ilatpu, also known as the Whitman Mission, was a very important station on the Oregon Trail. Marcus Whitman was a physician who was sent west from New England by the Presbyterian, Congregational and Dutch Reformed American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions with his wife Narcissa. While preaching to local Indians, the pair gave farming and professional medical care, but something didn't suit them. The Whitmans became dissatisfied with the Indians' increasing reliance on their mission for supplies. However, the Cayuses felt that the construction of Wai'ilatpu on their property, particularly given the relative wealth of its cabins and furniture, required the pair to distribute items. Previously, fur traders had put at risk Native Americans with contagious sickness, so when measles came to the mission in the mid-1840s, decimating the adjacent Cayuses, the Indians rightly blamed Whitman. Plateau Indians would not most often execute shamans for failing to heal patients. That was never their plan, but they did believe that overwhelming spiritual power may inspire deadly intent. Relations with the Whitmans had already deteriorated because of the Cayuse's hostility to American expansion, the missionaries' rigidity as before, the abolition of the fur trade, the language barrier, and the missionaries' concern that rival Catholics were plotting against them. After some time, that day came. On November 29, 1847, a couple of men dressed in disguise and armed with hatchets and rifles paid a medical visit to the Whitman. During the siege, more than 60 Cayuses and Umatillas killed the Whitmans and 11 or 12 other people at the mission and kidnapped 53 more. In addition to all the captured and killed ones, one woman wins the heart of an important man in that time. Lorinda Bewley was one of the prisoners. Lorinda, a 17-year-old mission teacher, was spared execution by the Cayuse leader named Five Crows. When he saw her, he thought he would enjoy the novelty of having a white wife. Needless to say, this did not go over well with the kidnapped girl. Lorinda was put up for ransom after refusing the offer of five crows for two weeks, according to history. The British paid the ransom in Fort Vancouver. According to eyewitness testimony of several of the surviving younger people, the assailants used their tomahawks to release bad spirits living as part of the whites. Marcus Whitman was severely beaten and Narcissa Whitman was shot dead. Following the 1846 Anglo-American split of the province, Oregon was governed by a provisional government at the time. The murders contributed to free soil northerners seeking to resist the South, that is, slaveholding and development into the Mexican session. President James Polk approved legislation in 1848, declaring Oregon the first U.S. territory west of the Rockies. The prisoners were freed during the subsequent Cayuse War of 1847 to 1850, but the conflict got worse as white immigration grew. The Americans lacked the resources and manpower to wage all-out war, but they exploited the Whitman massacre to excuse raids and put the offenders to trial in Oregon City in 1850. 
Following the failure of an inter-tribal coalition, the Cayuses were relocated to the Umatilla Reservation east of Pendleton in 1855. In 1853, Washington Territory was formed from Oregon and its first governor, Isaac Stevens, drove surviving Plateau Indians onto reservations. The Yakamas and others resisted, and their 1856 war, fused with fights on the Puget Sound and the Rogue River in Oregon, continuing until 1858, Northwest expansion would have proceeded independently of the Whitmans, but their sacrifice accelerated and legitimized American colonization. President James K. Polk dispatched a governor, judge, prosecutor, marshal, and militia to bring the Whitman murders to justice in the new United States possession. The Wailatpu Cayuse released five volunteers from their band after nearly two years of the pursuit. The five suspected murderers were transported by the United States Cavalry 250 miles from where they were living to Oregon City, the capital of Oregon Territory. Chief Telokite, Tomahas, Isia Shilukas, Klokomas, and Kiamisumkin were all found guilty in the murder of Marcus Whitman. The trial was one of the state's first efforts into formal and legitimate procedures for judicial proceedings. Early settlers from Oregon's frontier past took part in the trial, including Judge Orwell C. Pratt, Prosecutor Amory Holbrook, U.S. Marshal Joe Meek as bailiff, Frank Holland and George Law Curry as clerks of the court, and Francis Pettigrove serving as grand jury foreman. During the trial, each of the five Cayuse men were chained. They were provided with two interpreters, one to convert English language into Chinook jargon and the other to transmit Chinook jargon into Cayuse language. On May 21, 1850, the court procedures began. The first item of business for Judge Pratt was the selection of three defense attorneys for the accused. The court permitted the jury to assume that the five volunteers' surrender constituted an admission of guilt. After 75 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned a guilty judgment. The defense attorney then requested a fresh trial and the opportunity to appeal. Those motions were refused by the judge. On May 24th, Judge Pratt ordered that all five Cayuse be carried to the gallows and hung until they died. Soon after the trial, Governor Lane announced his resignation as governor, effective June 18, 1850. Secretary Pritchett, Lane's replacement, promised to pardon the five Cayuse, but the pardoning power would not be transferred to Pritchett until 25 days after the trial. As a result, Marshal Meek questioned whether it was appropriate to postpone the hangings for another two weeks. Judge Pratt stayed firm and directed Meek to follow the court's judgment determination. On June 3, 1850, U.S. Marshal Meek executed the inmates in front of a huge throng of spectators in Oregon City. They were buried in unmarked graves on the outskirts of Oregon City. The hand of justice was satisfied once again, and this meant a lot in those times when a lot of things went unnoticed. We believe that this was a lesson for many others and that many thought twice before they even thought of doing something. If you like this video and want more content like this, hit that like and subscribe button. Thanks for watching.